Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I want to welcome you to the National Archives tonight and the William G. McGowan Theater. I also want to welcome our C-SPAN audience tonight. C-SPAN is no stranger to this building, and we're always welcoming C-SPAN to share more of the archives' treasures with the American public. 39 years ago last month, Elvis Presley, the most famous popular singer of his time, appeared at the White House gate. He handed the guards a handwritten letter addressed to the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, asking to meet with him. The letter was whisked inside the White House, and within hours, the king of rock and roll, as Presley was known, and the leader of the free world, as all presidents are known, were meeting in the Oval Office. The official White House photograph of Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley in the Oval Office is one of the most requested images from the National Archives. And you ha if you haven't visited our shop, either physically or virtually, I encourage you to do so, where you can buy your own reproduction of that in paper or on a coffee mug and in several different formats. <laughs> that is archives.gov. Tonight, you'll hear about that famous meeting from two eyewitnesses. Our moderator for the discussion is Dr. Tim Naftali, director of the Richard Nixon President Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. Dr. Naftali came to the archives in 2006 as director of our Nixon Presidential Materials Project, then in 2007 became the director of the library after it was transferred to the National Archives by a private foundation. Since then, Dr. Naftali has overseen the near completion of an archival edition and an increase in activity and public programs in that library. We have released nearly 400 hours of Nixon tapes and more than 200 pages of Nixon textual material. He's conducted 126 video oral histories and has nearly completed the installation of a new exhibit on Watergate based on those oral history accounts. And he has managed the library through two earthquakes and a major fire. Before coming to the archives, Dr. Naftali taught history at several universities, including the University of Virginia. There, he was also director of the Presidential Recordings Program at the Miller Center of Public Affairs. He appears frequently in major print and broadcast media and has authored or co-authored four books, including Khrushchev's Cold War, The Inside Story of an American Adversary. In his most recent book, George Herbert Walker Bush appeared in 2007. Dr. Naftali holds an undergraduate degree in history from Yale, a master's degree in international economics from Johns Hopkins, and a master's and doctorate degrees in history from Harvard. And now I turn the program off of, over to Tim. Thank you, David. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Uh, David Ferriero uh, has been with us a few months and has made a great change, and uh, we're pleased to have him at the National Archives. Uh, welcome to Yorba Linda. It's much warmer here. Uh, actually, this is an away game for me, and I'm awfully cold. Um, first of all, please join me in welcoming Eagle Bud Krogh and Jerry Schilling. <laughs> Gentlemen. Uh, Bud, Bud Krogh was, uh, it's, you wait for the while. <laughs> Bud Krogh was a deputy to the council, to the president. He oversaw the war on drugs and also uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, he is perhaps the man most responsible for getting uh, metal detectors into American airports. Yes. Sorry about uh, that. He is now... <laughs> Seemed like a good no, idea I know, at the time. I, no, it, 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 no, it's, no it, it was a good start. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, and Bud is now associated with the Center for the Study of the Presidency and, and Congress. Congress. Jerry Schilling uh, was a close friend of Elvis Presley's for 23 years, and he worked for him for 10. Uh, he's also a veteran of the music industry, and you're about to find out that these men are both superb raconteurs. So. We're going to start now. Thanks. Jerry, set this up for us, OK? Because uh, you're, you're in Los Angeles. Right. You're not working for Elvis. Anymore, no. OK? It's 1971. Yep. What is Elvis doing flying by himself with a credit card? 
I didn't have a clue. I mean, I was asleep. <laughs> and I get this call. Hey. And I go, who is this? He says, it's me. So I knew it was Elvis. And uh, I said, where are you? And he said, I'm at the airport. He said, um, could you meet me at the, at the airport? He was either in Dallas or I didn't know where he was. And I said, well, who's with you? Elvis Presley always travel with an entourage. And he said, nobody. And he said, I don't want anybody in the world to know where I am. And he started giving me his flight numbers and what time he was coming in, things that Elvis Presley never did. So that was the start of me picking him up at LAX on a Saturday night about 1.30 in the morning. Uh, of course, uh, the next couple of days were quite interesting. Well, now, he calls you, and uh, he, he wants you to pick him up at the airport. Yes. Now, how often did Elvis uh, travel alone? Well, this was the only time in the 20, it wasn't 23 years then, but this was the only time in the 20 years. Not only not alone, but usually, you know, five guys at, at minimum, you know. He's never bought an airline ticket. He's never, you know, we had to say, Elvis, it's time, you know, we got to get to the airport or, you know, whatever it was. So this was, he was on, I didn't know what mission he was on. I'm not quite sure if he knew to the extent of the mission he was on, but he was on a mission. So, <laughs> and then you sort of, he's also running away from home a bit. He's all, he's only got one credit card. Yes, and um, you know, Elvis has been known as a quite generous guy, and um, uh, after I met him at the airport, I found out the next day, as when I realized late at night, almost early morning, that I was the only person in the world that knew where Elvis Presley was, I couldn't go to sleep, you know? So Elvis goes to sleep, and the next day is Sunday, and we get up and we have coffee at his old home in L.A. And it was just two friends really catching back up. And um, in that conversation, he had told me, he said, you know, I really got mad at Graceland. And he said, you know, people were uh, telling me how to spend my money. He was buying a lot of gifts. I mean, Vernon Presley and Priscilla Presley were only kind of looking out for him. And I think when, when the colonel got involved in it, Elvis just went, whoa. I think he got in his car. He went to the airport. He had an American Express credit card. Uh, I think he took the first flight out, and he wound up here in DC. Was he carrying guns with him? Always. But what happened? What's this? Well, that's it. Well, I thought since I raised since I raised the metal detector issue, what he had? What did he tell you about? He was inspiration for Bud. Oh, Uh, but but what happened on the plane? Um, Well, as I learned too, the next day, um, when he got to Washington, he checked into the hotel Washington, and then I don't think he knew. Well, what do I do now? So that's when he called me, went back to the airport, went through Dallas, and, um, uh, and got in touch with me. But he said what happened is uh, he, he was really upset about uh, people telling him how to spend his money. Uh, he, he, I didn't know he had gotten to Washington until the next day. But what happened is when he changed planes in Dallas, um, uh, he said, there was this smart aleck, little steward, with a mustache that came up to me and said, I couldn't, imagine this today. Came, but imagine this today. Yeah. Came up to me and said, you can't carry your guns on the plane. <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> Seems reasonable to me. <laughs> she didn't do anything wrong. It's now, a- now and, and, and all due respect and credibility to my friend, he did have concealed gun permits. He did. He had been collecting badges. Uh, uh, he had gotten, we had gone to rifle ranges. There had been threats on his life. And we, we were, including myself, we could carry concealed weapons. Anyway, Elvis got very upset, stormed off the plane, 
and the pilot came after him and said, Mr. Presley, it's okay. You can carry your guns. <laughs> that, that probably wouldn't happen today. <laughs> no. Well, he, he only had three. He only had three. Okay, so, so when did it become clear to you, this is in Los Angeles, yes. you picked him up, that you're going to go to Washington with him? Well, uh, Tim, as you said, I wasn't working for Elvis. I had worked a whole year at ABC television in a basement after quitting working for Elvis Presley trying to get in as a film editor. I was an apprentice, and I just got this job at Paramount Studios. And uh, so after this nice talk on Sunday that Elvis and I had, and uh, he said, this is a brown sunset. And he goes, you know, Jerry, um, I need you to come to Washington with me. And I go, Elvis, I can't. Uh, I said, you know, I've worked this whole year, as you know, to get into Paramount, I got to be at work in the morning. And, you know, he, he was hard to say no to. And he looked like a little boy. He goes, okay, you know. He said, first of all, he said, I'll get a Learjet and fly you back. Well, I'm thinking, they were upset with him back there because he was spending too much money. So, <laughs> so anyway, I go, uh, I said, Elvis, I can't. Uh, and then I thought, man, he had this incident flying out. On, on, on the airlines with the guns and everything. And I made a deal with him. I said, Elvis, if you will let me call Graceland, your father and Priscilla, and let them know you're not kidnapped, where you are, then I will take the all-nighter flight. And if I could call one of the security guys there to meet us, where I can go back and hopefully still have my job. So that... That started the evening of uh, uh, us with no money. <laughs> Elvis never carried money. Uh, taking all night flight from Los Angeles here to DC. But didn't you go into the old house and he took down from the wall one of his prized gifts or one of? Yeah, this was uh, this was uh, on Hillcrest Drive in, in, in Beverly Hills, and this is where he spent the night. And then and as we're getting ready to leave, Elvis had a little office, a very, very cool office. And there was a World War II commemorative gun. It was from Normandy and all these places. And uh, he took it off the wall. He didn't give me a reason. I was used to Elvis doing things without explaining them to me, you know. So he takes the gun with him. I don't know. I still don't, did not know why we were going to Washington. I was just making the arrangements. And I had been so many places with Elvis where I didn't know where I was going, so it was kind of normal for me. And now you ended up with $500. You, you... Yeah, we, I, 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 I talked Elvis into um, uh, letting his normal limousine driver take us to the airport, who he called, by the way, Sir Gerald, because he had found out years ago, I think, he was a driver for Winston Churchill or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Elvis was a real history buff. I mean, this is the thing. He knew, he knew his history. And uh, so it was Sunday night. We had no cash. I, I didn't have any, I didn't carry any cash because I just didn't have any. Elvis didn't carry any cash because he didn't have to. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, Sunday night, and I had Elvis's checkbook and, and uh, Sir Gerald, found a guy at the Beverly Hilton Hotel that would cash a check for $500. So I made out the check, had Elvis sign it. We, on the way to the airport, we stopped at the Beverly Hilton, and I had an envelope with $500 uh, in my coat and uh, <laughs> the brown leather jacket that I wore to the White House. Anyway. Very handsome outfit, by the thank way. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I knew you were impressed. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah. Right. I'm, I was about as out of my environment that day as I am tonight, so <laughs> bear with me. Yeah. So anyway, uh, they pre-board us on the plane uh, for the all-nighter, and it was Christmas time, and there were a lot of soldiers coming back from Vietnam, and the ones that saw Elvis there, they would say hello. He got into a real conversation with one soldier for, I mean, like 10 minutes. And he comes back to me, and I'm sitting in the window seat, and he's here, and he goes, where's that money? I knew what was going to happen. So I, <laughs> I said, what money? 
and he goes, the $500. I said, Elvis, we're going to Washington. That's all we've got. He said, you don't understand. This man's been in Vietnam. He's going back home for Christmas to see his family. He gave me the entire $500. Yeah. So. Then you find out about Senator Murphy. You know, um, I'm trying to think how the introduction was made. Uh, I don't know if you know. I don't. don't All I know is Senator Murphy was on the plane with us. Of course, he was in coach. We were in first class. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Now I'm I'm on government money. money. I'm on coach now coming here. But uh, anyway, uh, we had met when Murphy came on. I don't know if it had been from the guy who set up the uh, meeting that Elvis was having with John Finlater at the Bureau of, of Narcotics and, and, uh, and dangerous, Drugs. Dangerous, yeah, yeah, Dangerous Drugs. So, but when we were on the flight, about halfway through, Elvis went back and talked with uh, uh, Senator Murphy. And um, uh, when he came back, he sat down next to me. And I had never seen Elvis Presley write a letter. And he had only written three in his life at that point. That's when he was in Germany in the Army. So he said, do you think they have any stationery on the plane? And I said, well, you know, let me find out. And I asked the stewardess, and she brought us some American Airlines stationery. So I'm sitting here. Elvis is over there. He's writing a letter. You know, and I, I, I respected his privacy. I wouldn't look. I didn't say, what are you writing a letter about? What's going on? I, I'm still figuring out how I'm going to get back to my job without losing it. <laughs> and uh, uh, he finishes the letter and he goes, Jerry, um, would you proofread this for me? And I said, yeah. And I'm reading this letter. Jerry, and, while, you, while you tell us that, why don't we look at the first page of that letter? Oh, uh, OK. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, there's the American Airlines station. There so it is. What yeah. was your reaction when you read this letter? I got to tell you. Um, I was pretty, I was pretty impressed. I mean, it was. I knew Elvis so well and knew where his heart was, and there was obviously some uh, uh, grammar that could have been corrected. But I thought, you know what? This is a letter from a guy who experienced the real American story, from poverty to being probably the most famous guy in the world who was writing a letter from his heart to his president. And I said, you know, Elvis, I think you should send it just as it is. Yeah. Now, um, was it clear to you when, when you read it that, that, that Elvis wanted to meet the president? Yeah, because he stated to he him stated. inside that that's the first I ever heard of that. I thought we were, I didn't know why we were going back to Washington. <laughs> well, <laughs> Let's look at another page from this letter, and you can explain to us who John Burroughs is. John Burroughs is, uh, at one point, I don't even know if you know this, Tim, was a character Elvis played in a movie. Uh, and it was an, an alias that his manager sometimes used, Colonel Parker. And uh, so now you've got to picture this. This is Elvis telling the president that he's under an assumed name, <laughs> incognito, <clears throat> and that uh, to contact him, he should contact his public relations man, Jerry Schilling. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but you know, that's that's kind of how Elvis, you know, that's how he did things. <laughs> All right. So, 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 what time do you arrive in Washington? It was daybreak. I don't know the exact okay. time. So. The red eye. Right. Yeah, there was a real red So out. what are you going to do with this letter? Well, I, you know, I'm thinking, I, knowing Elvis, he's not going to put it in a mailbox, you know. <laughs> so, um, and I, you know, I just gave it back to him, and he would tell me what, what, you know, what he wanted to do, what he wanted to do with it. So um, we, I, I had called a car from, L, from L.A. to meet us. I called the limo. And I'd gotten uh, Sir Gerald to set that up for us. Thank God, because we had no money. And um, 
So it's, it's, it's actually before daybreak when we land. And we get in the limo, and Elvis said, I want to drop the, the letter by the White House. And I said, Elvis, <laughs> it's, it's not even daylight. And, and can we, let's just go to the hotel. I want to freshen up. You know, I've been up two days now. And, uh, and he said, no, 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 I, I, I really want to deliver this. I wanted to be there first thing Monday morning, which it was. Yeah. So <laughs> we're driving up to the gate. Bud, which gate is it? Is the it? Northwest Gate. Northwest. I always want to call it the West Wing or something, yeah. but it's the Northwest <laughs> Gate. So he said, you just stay in the car. I said, fine. <laughs> so Elvis gets out of the limo, and now it's starting to become dawn. What is he wearing? You've he, got to set the scene for us. He's, he's wearing a uh, Christian, no. He's wearing um, a kind of cape coat. He's got a cane. Actually, his hair was a little longer even than normal for Elvis. Uh, and, you know, for that time of the morning, it was kind of a Dracula look. You yeah. Know? And, uh, <laughs> um, so he gets out, and, he, and the, you know, the security guards at the north, north east gate? Northwest mm -hmm. gate. Northwest gate. I see this is not going well. So I jump out of the car and I say, gentlemen, please excuse me, but this is Mr. Presley who just wants to drop a letter off to the president. And they really warmed up and they said, you know, a senator's coming up at 7 and uh, Mr. Presley will make sure that your letter is, is carried up and uh, to be delivered to the presidency, uh, to the president. And so we got in the car and then we went to Hotel Washington. But when do you hear about the letter? Well, this, first, I, I just want to say, Tim, that it's a delight to be here uh, today. And, and Jerry, we haven't seen each other for since 39 years since that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just, <laughs> I, I'm, it's just great. Oh, my God. It's just, uh, uh, I mean, talk about instantly liking somebody when I, when I met Jerry and vice versa. And, and I will just tell you what happened because I was, I came in a little bit after the letter arrived okay, uh, because okay. we started early in that, in that White House. And I was sitting at my desk and I got a call from Dwight Chapin who is uh, the president's scheduling secretary and who I think we have to acknowledge tonight as the visionary for putting this whole thing together. That's true. I mean, Dwight yeah. Chapin yes. at 7.15 in the morning is a genius. Yes. So I mean, <laughs> so he called me up around, I don't know, 7.30, 7.45 and he says, but um, the king is here. <laughs> and I looked at the president's schedule and said, what king? There aren't any kings in the schedule here. What are you talking about? He said, no, not any two-bit king. The king, the king of rock, Elvis Presley, he's right here. I said, Dwight, come on. It's going to be a long day, four days before Christmas. He, he said, no, I'm reading this letter. He said uh, he wants to meet with the president, and um, he wants to help on the drug program, and that's what you work on because... One of Dwight's jobs was to help get people right. in the policy area involved. So he said, I'll send the letter over to you. You can read it and tell me what, what you think. So uh, White House messenger brings it over with a little red tag on it. And I start reading this letter. And I said, no, no, Dwight, you're really good. <laughs> now, full, full disclosure requires me to tell you that I belong to a group of eight guys who play practical jokes on each other in the White House every week. <laughs> and this was my turn to have one played on me by Chapin. So I figured, okay, well, I'll go along with it. I'll read this letter. And as, as Jerry said, it, uh, towards the end, it said, I'm staying over at the Washington Hotel under the name of John Burroughs. Um, would like to see you and the rest. Well, uh, I read it, and I figured, what do I do with this? Well, I'm going to try this out. So I called over to the hotel at, with the numbers that you can see on the screen. A private and confidential. Oh, we're good right, at that right. stuff. Yeah, it's a secret. <laughs> you can only and get to me. You can only get to you. And I get uh, Jerry answers the phone. I said, "My name is uh, Bud Krogan, and I have this letter here from Elvis Presley." I'm laughing on the phone because I'm expecting to be talking to Dwight's daughter, you know, <laughs> who's all part of it. And he said, uh, "Oh yes, Mr. Krogan, yes, that is one of the letters uh, you know, Mr. Presley has written, and uh, and we would very much like to see if we could uh, arrange uh, some kind of a meeting with the president." Well, I'm still thinking, uh, all right, so he got a, 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 an impersonator of an aide to, 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 take, to, to take this, and this is still Chapin's joke. Uh, so I said, look, why don't you come on over to the White House, and let's talk about this. Uh, because normally when you're responsible for a meeting with the president, you sort of like to know who's going to go in uh, into the Oval Office. 
So they said, oh, we'll be right over. Now, I think maybe a little time had elapsed from the letters delivery through the guard at the Northwest Gate to Chapin's oh, office yeah. to me reading it, talking it over with my hours ast the astounded when, staff. Did you expect to hear from the White House? Listen, Elvis went to a meeting, which I, he had ne I'd never seen him in a meeting either. And he had left me a phone number and said, you stay here and wait for the White House call. <laughs> I read a lot of Howard Hughes books where he left people in hotels for like a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He ended up staying there himself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Waiting for the same guy. It's so, a... And I didn't want to hurt Elvis's feelings and tell him we weren't going to get a call. So yeah. that's how that So you were surprised when, when, when this Mr. Crow called? I was surprised. And uh, after Bud called, I never underestimated my friend's power again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> since, you, since you mentioned Dwight Chapin, let's take a look at the memo yes, that he yeah. sent to, to Bob, Haldeman. Bob Haldeman, the president's chief of staff. <laughs> this is the memo suggesting, uh, offering the option that the president meet Elvis Presley. The, the most interesting part of the memo is page two. Let's go to page two. Do you see the writing? You must be kidding. <laughs> 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 and and uh, that's that's H. That means he actually said go ahead, and that's what led to. That's what, right, and, and where he said that he he wanted the president to start meeting young people, and let's begin with Elvis Presley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's start with the most famous man yeah. on the planet. So let's do that, and then Bob wrote, "You must be kidding!" But you see his big H there, yeah, approving, approving the meeting. So so we had a, a go ahead, but now this came a little bit after. I had had this audition meeting with Jerry and Sonny West. And one thing you might tell us a little bit is when did Sonny West join the mini entourage that, that came? That well, came when, uh, when I had made the deal with Elvis to have uh, security from Memphis meet us where I could get back to uh, California, uh, when I called Elvis, who was at uh, Findlater's office, uh, to tell him that you wanted to meet about the meeting with the president, um, Elvis said, and, and this is the type of friend he was. I mean, he's going to go, in his mind, to the White House, who was the executive offices. And, you know, he knew if he got that meeting, he knew he was, you know, nobody says no to Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I learned that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, what happened is, he said, Jerry, uh, go outside in front of the hotel, and I will swing by and pick you up on the way. And that's, you know, he included his friends and everything. As I was waiting and I saw the limousine coming, I saw Sonny getting out of a taxi. And I said, Sonny, put your luggage with the bellman. We're going, we're going to the White House. So that's how, that's how Sonny got involved. So, so how did the audition go? Well, the audition went splendidly. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know until I got a call from the Northwest Gate. This is now the old executive office building from the guard. Right. And I still did not know you guys were for real. Uh, and, and I thought, well, it's going to be an impersonator. You still don't know. I still don't know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. None of us are for real. Ooh. Anyway, so this guard said, Mr. Krogh, there's somebody here who looks surprisingly like uh, Elvis Presley. Uh, <laughs> he, he, and he's, he's wearing an interesting outfit. Um, and they were tart, tight-fitting purple velvet pants and yes. a silk shirt open yeah. to the navel with a gold chain. And um, what do you want me to do with him, sir? And I said, well, bring him on down to, to the office. And they, they brought him on down. It wasn't until they walked into my office that I realized, oh my goodness, this is Elvis Presley. <laughs> oh, and my secretary's, oh, Sandra Green. Oh, it is, it is Elvis Presley. And then you all came in, and I will tell you, that was one of the most lovely half hours that I've had uh, talking to you all and hearing Elvis talk from the heart about what his country meant to him. Uh, he sort of paraphrased the letter. Yeah, you know, I've gotten yeah. a lot from my country. Yes. I want to give it back. I want to help the country out. Uh, I can go into any group of people and be accepted by yes. anyone. Yes. Uh, and he had put in the letter that he would like to be made a uh, federal agent at large. <laughs> we don't have federal agents at large. <laughs> we got Secret Service agents, FBI. We got all kinds of agents, but not agents at large. Um, but that didn't seem to me to be a showstopper. But I should also, <laughs> full disclosure requires me to tell, I was the biggest Elvis fan in the 1950s. Never went on a date without him. You know, I mean, yeah. I would say, so here he is, <laughs> in my, and he's in my <laughs> office with you guys, and, and I'm trying to justify, how do I set this meeting up with the president? Because you have to write a script. 
of talking points. Yeah. And this was sort of a futile effort, but I mean, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm talking to him, thinking about it, what can I say? And, and I think you only stayed about a half an hour, and then I asked you to go back to the hotel. Right. And I said, we'll see if we can get the approvals. And this memo uh, was sent in right after I'd had that audition. Dwight had already uh, drafted up a lot of the content and the reasoning behind it. By, by say, he's the visionary for this whole thing. So I called him over and I said, this meeting has got to take place. The president has never met anyone quite like Elvis Presley. Elvis hasn't met anyone quite like the president. And what I'm really saying is, and I want to be in this meeting. And, I, I, <laughs> and, and, and here's the memo that puts you in the meeting. Yes. It's good. You yeah. see that? Participants, Elvis Presley, Bud Croak. Yeah, I wrote that. Does yeah. it, does yeah. it, say, <laughs> it actually doesn't say Richard Nixon. No, no. no. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> he's a given. He's like the desk. No, no, I, said, no I, I wanted to make sure that I would get in this meeting. And, and, and Dwight really wanted to set it up yeah. that way. So uh, I, I drafted this up and put some ideas about how Elvis could help us on the drug program because we wanted some support from the entertainment industry. Uh, we'd had a number of other entertainers come back, Art Linkletter mm -hmm, and others, mm -hmm. to help us out because uh, the, the government was inherently non-credible in what it would say about the risks and the dangers of drugs. So we thought this, this would be a helpful thing to do. So and also I think we wanted them to participate in writing a musical about getting high on life rather than yeah, high yeah. on drugs. I mean, I, I wasn't at my, the muse wasn't probably firing in all cylinders, <laughs> at, at that, but trying to find ways to justify it. So anyway, I, I sent this over and then got the word back from, from Dwight that uh, the meeting was on, uh, that Haldeman had approved it. And now d understand that this is all going over a two or three hour period. And we've got a lot of people working hard to see if we can pull this thing off. Right, right. And so after I got the word back from, from Dwight that Bob had approved it, uh, the chief of staff, and I think it's probably true today, approves all people that go into the Oval Office or he might delegate it to somebody. I called you back at the hotel mm -hmm. and I said, the meeting is on. Uh, come on back over here. We're going to have the session around 11.45. There was a, about an hour period of time when different guests could come in, and we had reserved, I think, about five minutes. It was going to be a drop-by, something like You all yeah, heard that yes. term of drop-by, they yeah. take pictures and the rest. Well, um, they came back over, and I got a call from the Secret Service, uh, the head of the Secret Service. And now remember what Jerry said about taking down this little thing from the wall uh, and somehow bringing that across the country. Um, the head of the Secret Service detail said, but we've got a little problem here. Uh, I said, what's that? He said, well, Elvis has brought a gun uh, with him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very nice gun. Uh, it's got battles of World War II engraved in the barrel, and there are bullets in the display case. Uh, he said, Bud, you know that no guns in the Oval Office is standard policy around here. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I realize that. And um, so I figured, God, I wish he told me about that. And in his letter, at the bottom of the letter, he said, I have a gift for you, which you, you can, I can give you now, or you can, I can give it to you later. So When, when you can receive it. But it would yeah. have been nice to know that he had a gun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, uh, well, but, well, why don't we, let's look at the gun. There's uh, a, we have a picture of the gun. We have a gift. Okay. Uh, oh, he uh, has to go. There, there it is. Isn't uh, that beautiful? But you can see why the Secret Service would wonder. You know, I, he's, yeah. he's, he's going to go in, he's going to take it out. But, of but the here's how responsible he was about the guns. When we were driving up uh, to the White, that drive that to me was to the White House, he took all of his guns off and put them on the floorboard of the car. That's very except, the, except this gift, you know, World War II, in a, in a case. There's an interesting thing, though. I don't know if you guys know. Speaking of the badge, the badge he was referring to, he really, he, he called it a different thing, but he knew the badge that he wanted. A year before, Elvis was, uh, for years, he collected badges, but not, but not honorary, real badges. And he went to rifle ranges, and we had the right to carry concealed weapons. One night, a private detective who had worked with Elvis on a couple of things set up a one of the few dinners we ever went to at famous restaurant in Beverly Hills at Chasen's. He wanted him to meet this guy who, who, who worked at Disney. His name was Paul Fries, and he did voices like Bo Winkle and stuff. And I'm thinking, why would Elvis want to meet this Disney voice character? And we go up to a private room, we have dinner, and O'Grady, the private detective, tells Paul Fries, Show Elvis your badge. Paul 
reluctantly showed him his Bureau of Narcotics and, and Dangerous, dangerous drugs. drugs. And Elvis, from that moment on, set out to get that badge. <laughs> well, yeah. now, I, now, that would have been helpful knowledge for, uh, for me. Well, well, but, but, <laughs> but that badge was the reason he met with Findlater. Exactly. Yes. So he who, tr who turned him down. Who turned, turned him down. down. Yeah. So the first person he meets... Turns them down. Turns it, so the you know, the, if, the head if you, of the bureau. If you can't get it, if you can't get it from from an agency head, you go to the president. Well, you go to the yeah, <laughs> you, you, you go right up the chain. Yeah. And, I, and I'm on that route to the top <laughs> of the chain. So anyway, I got the the I went across West Executive Drive and went over and I, I had to I took the uh, the the gun yes with the Secret Service on behalf of the president. And by the way, this gun is a featured exhibit. In your Belinda at the Nixon Library. You can go see this gun out yes. there now. It's a, it's a great gun. I didn't bring it with me. On yeah, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's right. That, that's, that's why. <laughs> so anyway, um, we took the gun, got past that, and um, then we're waiting there in the Roosevelt Room for the word from the Secret Service to go in. And he comes out and he says, Mr. Krogh, uh, the president is ready now. So we walked into the Oval Office and... Uh, uh, maybe you have the, you might well, go back. Let's go to the first, first Oval the Office. first Oval Office picture. Because he doesn't just he doesn't just have the gun. No, he, he has his photograph. See, I, I I wasn't really tumbling to the fact that he has a lot of photographs in his left hand, and he's got badges. And the president is shaking hands with him, and nice to see you. I mean, just to get Elvis over to the desk it took a little effort because he <laughs> walked in the door and he looked at the eagles engraved in the ceiling and eagles engraved in the carpets and the floor. And I knew it sort of overwhelmed him. Yeah. I'm a poor boy from Tupelo, Mississippi, and I'm here in the Oval Office of the President of the United States. So I sort of escorted him. You know, I put my hand on his back and moved him over to, uh, to the desk. And you can see here that he's wearing his cool glasses and his cape and his shirt. Nobody was ever dressed quite that way in the, in the <laughs> Oval Office. And the President had never seen anyone quite like that, that either. And there's, they're shaking hands, and Ollie Atkins, who is the White House photographer, did a phenomenal job of, with these photographs. And maybe what we can do is Does go the to the president look like he's kind of afraid to shake hands? Well, he, right? he's, he's not quite sure who, who he is. But, uh, and, well, now, he's, the next, let's look at the next photograph where Elvis is showing him the photograph. This, this and a little book I wrote about a while back was called Show and Tell. He is showing the president pictures of... Lisa Marie, I think, yes. uh, Priscilla, <laughs> and some of his badges from yes. all these different uh, departments around the country. And the president says, oh, that, that's it's beautiful and very nice. And <laughs> he's looking over at me. And I said, aren't they are nice pictures. Now, was and this it's... part of the play-by-play -play that you designed Well, the actually, I, I'm, I'm really going to resign as a script writer because not one thing that I put in my talking points <laughs> were actually said during the meeting. <laughs> so, so, but um, anyway, I'm standing off to the right a little bit watching this. Uh, how many of you have seen the film Forrest Gump? Okay, a lot of you and probably a lot of people watching in C-SPAN. Uh, remember that line in Forrest Gump where he's sitting on the park bench and he said, my mama told me that life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Well, this was my box of chocolates moment, my Forrest Gump experience. Uh, shall, we, shall we look at Forrest Gump? Let's take a look at Forrest Gump, please. There, there you are. There is Forrest. There there. Is Forrest. <laughs> so, so, does it look just like it? That's, that's there Forrest. There you are, Forrest. That's right. Well, they, <laughs> they make a remake of that. It's not Tom Hanks. No, it's Bud Krogh as Forrest Bud, Gump. Bud Krogh. There we are. You see all this? He's showing cufflinks that the vice president, <laughs> president of beautiful cufflinks, really a... nice cufflinks there. And I'm looking, yeah, those are, you know, those are really nice, this... Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> so then after we are going through um, show and tell like this and cufflinks and I'm having a good time and I actually you can see in my left hand I've got this pad because you take notes so that you can write the memoranda of the meeting afterwards. They start talking about things that Elvis has been studying and he had put this in his letter too yes. that I made a, a study of communist brainwashing. President, you have? Uh, and uh, he said, yes, and I've really been getting into that. And he said, okay. Uh, and then he said something about the Beatles that wasn't that flattering. Uh, he said, you know, the Beatles came over here, uh, made a lot of money, and said some anti-American stuff. And the president, Beatles, the Beatles have done that? And, and I didn't say, I'll get right on it, Mr. President. I'll find out what they're doing. You know, it's just, and then he talked about how difficult it was to play Las Vegas. And the president said, yes, I understand. That's a, that's a hard, hard gig to do out there. And I go, how does he know that? It's just a, <laughs> and so this stuff is going back and forth. And, and I'm just watching this amazing conversation unfold. And then, as Jerry has set this up so perfectly, the Elvis turns to the president. And he said, Mr. President, 
can you get me a badge from the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs? <laughs> <laughs> now, I ask this audience, if you don't know the answer to that question, what is the right answer as the staff person responsible for the meeting? What should I have said? Anybody help me here? Oh, wait, no, don't. No, yeah, I'll look into it. Let me check it out. Let me find out if it's legal. You know, I mean, a lot of things that you want to find out in advance. What do you think I said? Mr. President, if you want to get him a badge, we can get him one. Okay. Exactly. So, and so at that point, uh, the president said, get him a badge. I want him to have one. Elvis is overcome, and he steps forward, and he grabs the president, and he hugs him, which wasn't the norm in that White House. You know, there is, you know, it's just, uh, and I'm watching, this probably the last meeting they're going to let me run around this place. You know, I'm, I'm out of here. And then after that, he turned to the president, and this shows what Jerry was talking about in terms of Elvis's loyalty to his friends. And he turned to the president, he said, Mr. President, do you have time to meet my friends? it would mean a great deal to them. And the president looks at me and said, Bud, do, do we have time for that? I mean, it's a, I mean, already we are far beyond anything anybody thought about this meeting. And I said, oh, yes, sir, we do. He said, fine. So I went out, and I think I brought you guys back in. You did. You, you uh, there was a phone call that the aide that stayed with us while you took Elvis in first, uh, and he was explaining to Sonny and I how, you know, um, it, it was even above the president. It was a Secret Service thing, and, and the phone rang, and he, he got the call that the president yeah. wants to meet Mr. Presley's friends. Now, I have to interject one thing. Elvis did like the Beatles. Oh, good. Now, this is and, helpful. And, and, BBC and, will want to know this. Yeah, and, <laughs> he did. Elvis, if you look underlined, was trying in his mind to say everything to President Nixon because the government was after John at the time, and the sleep-in and all that kind of stuff. He was trying, and he brilliantly did, get the president to, re he, he was relating to the president on his level, he saw. That's why. He liked, he recorded three of their records. <laughs> yeah, but he loved the Beatles, that's right. He loved the Beatles, okay. yes. So, so anyway, then you might go on to the yeah, next. Let's go to the picture. Ne with next the, picture. With, uh, when the friends come in. When the friends come yeah. in. Uh, <laughs> there they are. There's your cool leather it's jacket. Very nice Isn't jacket. that cool? Which one and, am and, I? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're next to Elvis right, right there between right. Sonny. And Sonny is, is wearing you know, his dashing black tie suit and shirt. And he was just out at the library, wasn't he, Sonny West, just mm -hmm. about two or three months ago? Oh, yes. And you've been yeah. invited back. I found that today. Oh, so they really? want you to come back. So here they're all in there talking to each me. other. And, <laughs> what you're doing. And the president's got his hands on his hips. And he said, you got a couple of big ones here, Elvis. <laughs> you know? <laughs> hey, you know, when, when, we, when we walked in, and Tim, if I could talk about the first impression. I was, I was a history major. And I was in my... My last semester, I was going to be practice teaching. I was the one student who got to do that. And when you took us down to the Oval Room, if you remember, it wasn't a staff guy or any opened the door. It was Elvis. And so pictures are flat, right? And all the stuff I had seen at the White House, when Elvis opened the door and said, come on, you know, I looked down and there was the president at his desk at that yeah. point. Yeah. And I realized the oval room was oval. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was my first. Wow. And Elvis thought I was afraid, which I was intimidated. And he kind of pushed me in. As, and Sonny comes in. And as we're going over, uh, the president kind of did a little thing like that on my shoulder. Yeah, he, he whacked and, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and goes, uh, Look like some football players. Yeah. It wasn't not a technical assault. It was no, just a no. Little, you know, just a little punch. But, but the, I, then I realized there was a human side of President Nixon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and what was so fun about this part of it, too, is that after the president has met with some guests, uh, he often likes, when the meeting's coming to an end, he wants to give gifts uh, to the people that have been there. Now, let's say that you've won the award for best cow for the 4-H club in <laughs> King County, Washington, and you come to the Oval Office, right, right. the president will go in his bottom drawer and give you a golf ball. Here's your ball. And it's no, <laughs> it's, there's no connection between ball, cow, 4-H, here's your ball. Uh, but it's, it's nice, and, and it's cheap. <laughs> now, this is one of the most abiding memories that I have of this entire episode. The president went behind his desk, 
and he opens the bottom left-hand drawer. I wonder if you could go back to a picture with the desk. Yeah. Uh, if, Can we go uh, back to the desk? Okay, see the telephone in, uh, what is it, on your left side. The bottom drawer on that side of the desk is where he had the gifts. And they're arranged by golf balls through cufflinks to bracelets to pins. Yeah. And I don't know if it's an ascending order of value from the cheapest to the 16 karat gold that you give to the big hitters. Right. Uh -huh. uh, but anyway, he's behind his desk, starting to reach down. Now, Elvis didn't get to be the king of rock by not knowing where the gold is. <laughs> so he went behind the desk with the president. <laughs> The KGB can't do this, you know, but Elvis Presley is diving into the president's drawer and the president's looking at me and he's cleaning me out. He's going back in. Now, I mean, you saw this I was whole thing. And remember yeah. what he said. Remember, Mr. President, they have and wives, wives and too. sweethearts. Yeah. <laughs> and Elvis wasn't clear about what he was saying there. But I don't remember the sweethearts. But don't the wives. Wives. <laughs> Maybe it was just wives. And so out come all these presents. This is four days before Christmas. They did all their Christmas shopping in the president's yeah. drawer. You know, and I'm watching this. Oh, there's a florist over there. Well, looks pretty good to me. And so, so anyway, what did you get, by the way? I always wondered what... Uh, I got, you know. I got a, a set of cufflinks. And then when Elvis said, you know, they have wives, uh, there was a, a, a gold president uh, pennant for my wife. Yeah, and, and I think those were the 16-karat gold ones that were towards because Elvis could immediately, I mean, he did... <laughs> <laughs> we'll get those out there for you, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, they, they, you all left pretty laden down. You know, this was, yeah. this was a gift period. And we walked across the, oh, this is a good picture to show you going across the Oval Office. We went out just to the right of that little cruel work, which is the symbol of the seal of the President of the United States that Julie, the President's daughter, had, had uh, done for him during the campaign and gave it to him when Nixon went over the top uh, that night mm -hmm. when he was elected. And it was just to the right of that. You can see that door. And then we went down to lunch in the, um, in the mess. Now, the White House mess is a place that has seen many famous people, uh, movie stars, uh, famous senators, even heads of state would like to be able to eat there. But when I walked in to the White House mess with Jerry and Sonny West and Elvis Presley in his great outfit, people, the jaws just dropped. <laughs> And, of course, I went over. Uh, did you hold his chair or did Sonny hold it? I did. I, 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 I was so proud of him at that point. He'd done I didn't usually pull out a chair for Elvis. Yeah. But, you know, and it, remember you got the table. We didn't have a, it was in the center of the. Yeah, the center uh, of, the, of the place. Yeah. That's right. And I saw Elvis kind of, I just, I kind of pulled out the chair and, you know, and he, he sat down sat there. Down. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, do you remember what you ate? God, no. I don't know. Always <laughs> no. a cheeseburger. Well, I've been up almost three days now. That's right. <laughs> so we, we had a great lunch uh, together. And then afterwards, now, you have to understand, halfway through this meeting, the president and Elvis concluded that it ought to be kept secret. Because they weren't sure that their respective constituencies right. would understand why we were all yeah. together, you see. <laughs> and so Elvis was saying, well, you know, it's, uh, I think we need to keep this confidential. And the president said, good idea. Yes, that's a good idea. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Well, um, after lunch, uh, I called John Finlater over at the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. And... Um, you know, this decision to give a, 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 the badge was not my finest hour. I just want you to know. I just said, yes, I went along with it. I should have thought it through. But I said, uh, John, uh, the president has decided that he would like to give uh, an authentic badge to, uh, to Elvis Presley. And John Finlater's response was, well, I guess it's not so bad to be overruled by the president. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, had, he had given the correct answer before. Right, and, right, uh, right. and so uh, he brought a badge over. Uh, after and, lunch. And, uh, that's why we had lunch, because Elvis was not going to leave. To leave without it. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You got that right. Could, could, yeah. could, we, could we see that badge? Please? Yeah. Could, let's, yeah. Look, let's, let's take a look at the badge. There, there it is. There's yeah. the badge. Yeah. That's a beautiful badge. It's the real thing. I wish thing. I had one. It's a, yeah. so, um, so he brought that badge over, and, um, and you, did, you did leave with that. Now, when I said it was secret, it was secret not just for a week it was a secret for 13 months. Is that amazing? Now, here's the way Washington works. Some people will write memoirs. And somehow those memoirs, those drafts, might get into the possession of an investigative reporter. 
Uh, Jack Anderson was a very popular, you know, you all, how many remember Jack Anderson? Oh, you all do, merry-go-round, <laughs> merry-go-round. You turn to that first. Uh, and there was a story that came out on January 25th, uh, 1972. And I will get, uh, you can't see this, I don't think we have a slide. Presley gets narcotics bureau badge. <laughs> now, now this is not exactly a, a hot news story. This happened a year and a month earlier. But Finlater's memoirs had gotten to Jack Anderson. Uh, and it was like, he got a narcotics badge? What's this all about? And I he tells wondered it, how he got it. That's how he got yeah, it, from, from John Finlater. And then John Finlater's uh, uh, memoirs, he describes the first meeting that he had with, with Elvis. Mm -hmm. And then my call later on. John right, and I right. were good friends, and I, oh, okay. I felt badly about uh, really making the call. But uh, not so bad. Uh, no. <laughs> so bad right now. Jerry, could you tell us, uh, you, you got a bit of a tour of the White House. What did Elvis uh, say when he saw the Situation Room? Well, you know, Elvis was um, uh, a huge film buff. And there, there was a, a film called uh, Dr. Strangelove, <laughs> and which we, we saw, oh, I guess, 15 times at our private screenings. And Elvis could play every part. He could, pay, he could play Peter Sellers choking himself. He could, he could do George C. Scott, well, Mr. President, and all that stuff. He was, he was, he, he was a great actor, actually. And um, so there's a part in there where they go in the situation, situation room, and Peter Sellers uh, says, uh, you can't fight in the war room. So... We go in the Situation Room, and Elvis <laughs> says, you can't fight in the war room. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he had a great oh, sense of humor, too. He, he I, did. I think we can see an image of the Jack Anderson uh, there it is. article. Oh, is it not? Let's uh, maybe we'll... I'm uh, looking at it, but I'm not sure. We're, we're looking at it. Oh, well, we're it is. Little, no, Presley gets Narcotics Bureau. We have badge. everything yeah. at the National Archives. You guys are amazing. <laughs> uh, yes. Where did you get that? That's amazing stuff. So, mm -hmm. it, it, and you know when you, you have a meeting like this occur, I, I thought, all right, it's a great meeting. It's the rest. It's secret. I didn't say anything to anybody. Now, imagine this. The King of Rock comes to the White House in the morning. And we weren't secreting him through tunnels or anything like that. No. I mean, we were moving him through the Roosevelt Room into the Oval Office. Afterwards, we went down the halls, yeah. and Elvis was friendly with a lot of the oh, employees. He kissed a couple of the girls. Kissed a couple of the girls. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, and um, they re remembered that. And, uh, <laughs> and so it, it was something where to keep that confidential is almost, I mean, it's incredible. How, did, how could that happen? Top secret material floats out of that place every day, you know. <laughs> but having this man come in with you and with Sonny and have that be kept secret for 13 months was incredible. And I think that's what really piqued um, Jack Anderson's uh, interest. Did, did yeah. you get special bragging rights in the Nixon White House because Absolutely. You, had, you had met? Oh, I, and I have just, you know, I've milked this as much as possible. But, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> we still are. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. 40 years later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, you know, uh, of course, it's not a lie, but uh, through the magic of, of a video, we, uh, we can now listen to President Richard Nixon yeah. uh, remember meeting Elvis Presley. Yeah. So if we could play that clip now. Elvis was clutching some badges uh, from various police departments and sheriff's departments around the country. Then Elvis starts showing the president his cufflinks, and the president's looking at those. Oh, those are nice cufflinks. Well, he was very flamboyant. President Nixon recalled the meeting in a 1990 first, interview. Uh, I didn't know that much about him except what I had read. Uh, but as I talked to him, I sensed, too, that basically he's a very shy man. The flamboyance was covering up the shyness. People say that because later on it was found that he had used drugs, uh, that therefore he could not be a good example. They overlooked the fact that he never used illegal drugs. It was always drugs prescribed by his physician. But I think that he was a very sincere and decent man. You know, you know there's an interesting... Uh, I'll let you... Uh, well, you know, um, it's a, it, there's an interesting thing, and, and uh, you know, what, what the president said... Uh, is true, actually. There is a difference between uh, street drugs and prescription drugs. You can certainly abuse uh, uh, prescription drugs. But, you know, my observation of this meeting, when I, I saw uh, the most powerful person in the world uh, who, you know, 
personally, politically, I was on the other side at that time. Uh, and I saw him meeting the most popular person in the world. And I saw there was these two great men, when you think of the world and history, both who were at the, had been at the, at the top of their professions but weren't at that moment. Uh, you know, Elvis was, you know, it, it was okay at the time, and the president wasn't that popular at the time. But my observation of seeing two great men connect on a human level, and I think they really got the loneliness of both of their positions in the world. And it wasn't just that meeting. They stayed in touch. Yeah. And I admired, first of all, if there was ever an American story, that was Elvis Presley. We grew up in North Memphis, poor section. If you ever saw a movie called Hustle and Flow, that's where Elvis and I grew up, and Sonny. And um, uh, here we were in the Oval Room of, uh, of the White House with the President of the United States, and they really had a human, uh, the President got, as you did in the pre-meeting, God, what Elvis's intentions were. Elvis, un he in his own way, understood the, a certain amount of the pressures of, 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 of the presidency. Yeah. And it was a real, uh, uh, there's so many funny things about that meeting, but the real thing about that meeting to me, if there was ever a true American story, I think that's one of the, the top. Jerry, tell a little bit of when, um, when Richard Nixon went into the hospital, uh, what Elvis did. Elvis uh, called him when uh, uh, the president had phlebitis. And when Elvis went in the hospital, the president contacted okay. him. Yeah. And uh, uh, there was a really mutual respect. And you know, it was nice to know that a person so powerful as the president of the United States was a human being. Yeah. You know, I got to you know, witness that personally. We, um, we, of course, have a clip from President Nixon. Do you recall Elvis Presley later talking to you about the effect that this visit had on his life? Well, you know, he was, what he was really proud about was that he got the badge. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. He got the, and, he got the uh, badge. That was his main... Uh, and he was very particular with this badge, though. He wasn't, you know, like... You know, we met on tours and stuff. We had a lot of security, and Elvis liked to hang out with, with the police officers. Some became good friends of ours in various parts of the country. And he would always, as he did to the president, but he would... He had a briefcase of real badges from different states, and uh, he was very particular who he showed this badge to. He, he carried that. it, didn't oh, he? Oh, always, yes. and, and that's yes. on display at Graceland, Graceland right yes. now in that long hall of awards. Yeah. It's up on the, the wall. The wall of gold. Yeah, wall of gold, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, we'd like to open this up to questions. Yeah. So there are mics on the left and on the right. Um, mm -hmm. If you have any questions for... Jerry or Bud. And by the way, um, I, I think we have copies. Uh, I hope we have enough here of Elvis and Nixon in the Oval Office. This is the one that, uh, that David was referring to, and I think we brought a few hundred of them. Are they back there, Melanie, in the back? So if you want to pick this up on the, on the way out, this is on a pamphlet that I wrote a few years ago. And the book that I wrote, uh, uh, The Day Elvis Met Nixon, 15 years ago, is going to be reprinted by the uh, Nixon Library, and it should be out the next few months. I think it's a great book. It is really this is the it has everything in it. It's, it's a great book. It's a, yeah. Yeah, it has very few words, which is good because I don't write that. <laughs> it's a, but it's got lots of the pictures that you've seen tonight, and some more that you that you haven't seen. So that hopefully will be out. But you might want to take this one because, as David said, this is one of the most requested. Um, one of the most is, requested is photographs. Yes. Uh, yeah. And but you sell them, right? So I. We know. Uh, well, <laughs> well, okay. The, much That's better quality. Yeah. This, <laughs> what can I say? This, these are cheapos, but you might have fun with this. It's a uh... start over there. Um, so of course we all hear about the White House tapes. Is there a tape of this visit, and has it been released? No, no because the taping system did not start until February of 1971. Yeah. You know this event, right? 
because no, of no, this. No, no, it wasn't because of this. Because of right. this event. I would have uh, better notes if it no, had been No, we, we wish there were a, a tape. This would be a wonderful, this would be the most requested White House tape. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A set of transcripts. In the video clip with the president, he said he only knew about Elvis what he had read. And I had heard that he really didn't know very much about him at all. Uh, can you comment on that, Sherry? How, I or, think Bud, or Bud? Yeah. Well, you, you know, I think, you know, he was very much in, in tune with, I think, uh, America, Americana, what was going on. He certainly knew who Elvis Presley was. I don't know whether he followed the career uh, completely, but he certainly understood his place in American culture, his importance. I think Haldeman understood that. I think, obviously, Dwight Chapin, who conceived this whole thing. This would not have happened without Dwight's uh, foresight and vision. Uh, but I think that the president was aware of it. But I don't think he played the tunes at night. He played Rachmaninoff. <laughs> <laughs> Love Me Tender, but a few others would have been good. But, yeah. Sir? Uh, the question for Jerry. Just wanted to know if you had any insight or details of the logistics of Elvis leaving Memphis and first his first trip to Washington as far as, you know, it just it's mind-boggling to think that Elvis gets on a plane in Memphis uh, comes to Washington, you know, if I was walking through the airport, I'd, you know, I'd be standing there probably still just staring and, and waiting for Elvis to do or say something. But as far as him arriving in Washington and checking into the hotel, any, did he give you any details as far as anything happening, his taxi ride, his, you know, I'm just curious if you had any details on that. Uh, there was a couple of details. One, one was, um, uh, you know, what I'd mentioned earlier about the flight coming back to meet me and the gun situation. But uh, there was, to tell you what a great actor Elvis was, there was a situation where on that first trip, uh, as the car was taking him to the hotel, uh, he stopped at a donut shop. And, you know, Elvis, uh, he didn't care where things were. It wasn't in a a really good neighborhood, and it was predominantly um, a pretty rough, rough place. As I found out later, he was just telling me he stopped at this donut shop, and he had all the jewelry on, you know, the rings and everything, and uh, so these kind of um, uh, superfly guys were going, hey man, that's some really nice jewelry, and all of a sudden he goes in his gun, and his boot pulls out a little uh, snub nose gun and says, yeah, and I aim to keep it. And they all laugh. <laughs> now, how good an actor he was. Uh, there's a, a famous author named Peter Gorelnik who is the best music author. He's searching for Robert Johnson and everything. And he did Last Train to Memphis. And as I did 11 years of interviews with him for these two books, um, he kept calling me back and saying, now how were you at the donut shop uh, when this happened? Because, and he's, and, I'm, and I kept telling him, you know, I don't know, but you know, and Elvis had told that story so much. This was before he came and got me. I thought I was there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I had, you know, I had to rescind my thought about being there. Sir? Uh, this question is for Jerry. Uh, was the soldier that you guys gave the money to on the plane, was he white or black? Uh, God, you know, we didn't really think in those terms that much, actually. Um, I had heard that, I had heard both. You know, I don't really remember, and I, it wouldn't, I don't know. That'd be you interesting know? to know. Yeah. The house that... It wouldn't have made any difference to him. No, it wouldn't have made any difference. The house that uh, Elvis met you at, mm -hmm. was that a gift to you from Elvis? No, no. Um, uh, this was his house on Hillcrest. Uh, it was worth a few million dollars. Uh, uh, he bought me my home in uh, 1974. I live up in the West Hollywood Hills. And uh, for no reason, nobody knew it except the inner circle. And... Uh, Elvis had knew, known that I had lost my mother when I was like a, a, a little over a year old. And uh, uh, just uh, out of the blue, he said, you know, you never really had a home. I want to be the one to give it to you. And so I still live there. So, But th that's the type of real person he was. Thanks. 
Sir? Uh, Mr. Schilling, uh, Mr. Crow, I'd like to thank you very much for coming uh, to Washington to tell this story. And uh, you've talked about, um, in this meeting, we, we saw the human side of both President Nixon and Elvis Presley. And I don't mean this to be a, a hostile question, but more of a sympathetic one. Um, wasn't Richard Nixon a bit of a hypocrite to rail against drug abuse when it was alleged that early in his presidency he was taking anti-convulsant medication to relieve stress? And yeah, I believe it's been well documented that he was abusing alcohol uh, as the Watergate scandal began to unravel? Well, I, 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 would, I would have to take uh, issue, I think, with the premise of the question. I don't think that, at least to my knowledge, that there was any history of abuse of alcohol at all. I mean, and in terms of the drugs that he used, I think they were all prescribed drugs. Uh, I did work on the narcotics programs for Richard Nixon for four years. And he focused very uh, specifically on what he thought were the most dangerous drugs, heroin in, in particular. And he shifted the national policy from a primarily law enforcement policy to treatment, rehabilitation, research, education, because he saw that as where we could get the greatest value. And it was done, I think, because he felt that was the best policy. It would have the greatest effect, would also reduce crime. So I don't see that there was real hypocrisy. I didn't think that it was an antagonistic question. It's a good question. Well put. Well put. I just read in a newspaper a few days ago of a woman who um, was working at the White House uh, and apparently she claims that Elvis was having an affair with her for three years and that was the reason why he came to D.C. <laughs> <laughs> um, We'd have to ask Jack Anderson. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have no knowledge. I don't know that. what happened before he came to LA uh, to meet me, so I don't know uh, what his intentions were coming here um, uh, originally. Uh, I don't know, but uh, 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 we did have a friend in Washington uh, that we had met in Vegas, uh, 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 two sisters, and uh, that's probably where that came from because she uh, had worked with the government as well. So. That, that never got to my office. <laughs> <laughs> and he never mentioned that to me. And I, you know, I spent three days with him. I mean, he told me everything that had happened. Uh, but I don't, you know what? I don't remember him mentioning that uh, at all. Thank you. I, um, this question is for Jerry. I understand that 10 days after his White House visit, Elvis was in Washington and toured the FBI headquarters and wanted to meet with J. Edgar Hoover, who was on vacation at the time. Do you know anything about this? Did he stay in Washington the whole time? Did he fly back to Memphis and fly um, to Washington again? No, he, after we left, he personally, he, uh, in the car, dropped me off at the airport where I could get back to my job. And then he and Sonny took a commercial, uh, uh, another commercial flight back to Memphis. I think in, in his excitement about the visit, and we had a good friend, uh, uh, Bill Morris, who was the mayor back there, and he was the one that got Elvis as one of the 10 outstanding young Americans, which Elvis mentioned to the president, who was one of those as well. I, then Elvis, and I'm back in L.A., but he did make another trip and brought Bill Morris and a couple of people, and uh, he did not meet Hoover. Hoover but. It was a lot harder to meet with J. Edgar Hoover than with a president. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can vouch for that. I was only on so. Thank you. Spam. Sir. Uh, I'm just wondering, did you get to keep your job in L.A.? You know? And how did, how did the explanation go? Um, <laughs> right. That's great a good question. question. That's a great question. I did, I did keep my job in L.A., and there was no way I was going to tell them the truth. That's right. They would have never believed it. They would have fired me, you know. So um, uh, I just reported. Uh, I meant to call. I was sick. Uh, and, uh, and I worked there for a, another few months, and then Elvis... Uh, he liked the way I'd set up things with you and everybody, bud. And mm -hmm. he had told me on the way to the airport that he wanted me to come back to work for him. And if I did, then I could be an editor on his films. Mm -hmm. And I didn't answer him. 
And then I get in, in the mail business cards. Jerry Schilling, personal public relations to Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, if he wants me to come back this bad, and I, I, I did love working for him. Uh, a few months later, I quit Paramount and went back to work for Elvis. <laughs> I don't think there are any other questions, so do you have some final thoughts? Well, i just you know, like to say that the, the story probably is, uh, it doesn't have many redeeming, scholarly, literary, historical, philosophical importance. But it's pure Americana mm -hmm. that uh, these two people could come together and, you know, given Dwight's vision and the fact that I was a crazy fan of Elvis and, and you were terrific in talking to on the phone. And, these are just a, a bunch of guys trying to, to make something happen and not knowing at the time that it was really significant. I mean, this yeah. was just, wow, look at these two people together and then watch them, as Jerry said, relate to each other person to person and like each other. Yeah. And, and in the book, you know, what we tried to do is show some of the parallels. They came from absolutely uh, dire poverty and rose to the pinnacle in their particular professions. And what did it take to do that? I mean, the drive and the talent mm -hmm. that Elvis had, that voice and Nixon's drive. And, and there are a lot of similarities in the way that they, they lived. Uh, their mansions and their, their gestures, you know, Elvis with the guitar and Nixon, you know, he had his, uh, <laughs> this, it, and it, just, it was just a beautiful thing to watch. And you don't want to overstate its significance, but it, it's really part of our country that you can have somebody like Elvis come in and meet the president, mm -hmm. have them relate to each other in a very positive way and, and be kind to each other yeah. and then yeah. want to follow up. I, I just, I love the story, as you can probably see. <laughs> yeah. Jerry? Well, um, God, you know, there's so many thoughts that go on my mind. Um, uh, I guess to sum it up, um, to be able to uh, have a, a, um, a friend like Elvis Presley, I could have never dreamed of as a, as a young child. Uh, and to live in uh, uh, a country that something like this could happen. Um, I've been very fortunate and very proud uh, to be here at the National Archives. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful feeling. It's almost intimidating. And uh, uh, I don't think um, a, an experience in life, uh, these experiences that I, I got to have because of my friend and, and certainly this historical one, uh, Life doesn't get much better, and thank you guys for being here, too. Well, I want to, I want to thank uh, Tom Nastic for organizing this and uh, Jeffrey Jackson, who's back there, and he was the wizard with all these wonderful images, and, of course, Bud and Jerry. This has been a superb evening, and as I said, weren't they wonderful raconteurs? Thanks, thank you. <laughs>